Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here with all of you today. And today we'll discuss on the topic of fearlessness. Fearlessness in bhakti or fearlessness in the Lord's protection. So here the context is that Vidura is speaking with Uddhava. And Vidura is expressing his own heart's consciousness. If we look back at his life, there was a sudden drastic change for him. Although he was never very beloved in the Kuru assembly, still that was where he had lived throughout his life. He had served his brother and his kingdom and in the one moment he had just been driven out, completely helpless, bereft of everything. It's sometimes if we are staying in a home and somebody who is authority in the home just drives, kicks us out of the home. We are in a job and somebody kicks us out of the job. But this is worse. Like imagine on the same day you are kicked out of your home and your job. And not only that, you are kicked out of your home, job and country. Like deported, pen penniless. So it was a very difficult situation. Now he accepted it gracefully. And the multiple points that he is making in this verse, he basically makes three distinct points. One is that he is saying that I have moved invisibly. It's an interesting point. I have been moving invisibly in the world. In the, he was a part of the royalty and as a royalty, he was well known. Wherever he would go, oh, this is the brother of the king who has come. So he would be a celebrity. But in those times, there was no social media. So, you know, pictures of people also were not very common. That's how even the Pandavas, when they went, went on Agyantavas, they could actually stay Agyant. Because people had heard of them, but pictures were not that common. So Vidura would also stay. Uh, he, nobody, he, he was seen, but he was not seen. In the sense that nobody recognized him. So he said, I have moved invisibly. The second point he makes is that the Lord is misunderstood. Hmm? That Vidam Bane, you know, that the Lord is misunderstood by people. And third point he says is, I am not astonished. So, what exactly is the connection between, there are other points also, but broadly what is the connection? So he says, the Lord is misunderstood means, the Prabhupada goes into the theme of fearlessness and being protected by the Lord. So what is going on over here is, that an ordinary person may think that he was standing, Vidura was standing up for truth, for principles. He was, Duryodhan and Dhritarashtra were anti-Krishna were anti-Pandavas and Vidura was standing up for them. So, why did the Lord not protect him? Why did the Lord not stop the Pandava, Kauravas? So, the way the Lord acts is mysterious. When they say the Lord is like ordinary people, that means, he said the ordinary people, sometimes you can count on them, sometimes you can't count on them. Sometimes people make a promise and then they don't live up to the promise. You know. You know, sometimes nowadays politicians, they offer their, they give their words before the elections. And after that we find the only thing they have given is the word. <laughs> There's nothing more that they give after that. So the thing is that people in this world are often not reliable. And when we misunderstand the Lord to be like a person in this world, that means we may start thinking, I can't count on the Lord. I was in California and I was going for a program. So in a car in front of me there's a bumper sticker. Says, the more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> so the idea is we realize people are not reliable. So when you think of God as ordinary, there can be many different meanings. But in this context, it is that maybe we can't count on Krishna. Mm -hmm. And what he's saying is, I'm, I'm a, people might think I was abandoned, I was not protected by the Lord. But, he says, I have traveled across now. After leaving, I left everything behind, I traveled across and wherever I went, the Lord provided for me. And I have understood that this is the way of the world. Now, Vidura himself was already wise. 
his, his Vidurniti was spoken long before he renounced the world. Hmm? He was already wise, but still there is wisdom that is tested in adversity. There is wisdom that can be spoken in prosperity. And it doesn't mean it's unrealized. But it becomes still deeper. Gold is always gold, but when gold goes through fire, it becomes more shining. So Vidura was always wise. But now he has gone through adversity. And after going through it all, see that, yes, the Lord is real, the Lord does protect. And what happened to me? He says, I am not astonished by it. So he says, after living in anonymity, it's almost like two opposite ex extremes. You know, One is celebrity, being known wherever we go, and then living in anonymity, where we go and no one knows us. After having lived in both these extremes, I find that actually the Lord was with me, the Lord is with me. And for what has happened and how it happened, it's I am not astonished by it. I am not astonished by it. So now we will, so Vidura has through his experience ex saying that this, the Lord is the protector and my faith in him is not shaken at all. He is always the protector. So we'll talk about this theme, Prabhupada quotes 16.1 in the Bhagavad Gita, the Daivi Swabhava, Abhayam Sattva Samshuddhi Jnana Yoga Vivastiti. So it's interesting, Prabhupada doesn't just quote Abhaya over here. He's quoting Abhaya and Sattva Samshuddhi. So it's like fearlessness and purification. Sattva Samshuddhi. So it's interesting to explore the connection between these two. And what that means for us when we understand, want to understand protection by the Lord. So I will talk about this in broadly three terms. First is, you know, our understanding our own level. Hmm? And without understanding that level, what that's pointed through by this fearlessness and purification. Then we will talk about avoiding extremes. Mm -hmm. And then we will talk about uh, connecting with the Lord and staying connected with Him. That is, I'll talk about transcendence. What it means for us at our level. So we'll talk about broadly. Uh, we have to let the world go if we have to hold on to the Lord. So now, what does the level mean? See, generally, desire and fear, they go together. Wherever there is de desire, there will be fear. Now we can say anger also comes along, but when we don't get what we desire or when we are about to lose what we desire, we get anger. But when that background is there, oh, I might lose it. So desire and fear come together. Krishna talks about this in 16.11 and 12, when he says, Chintama parimeyam cha pralayantam upashritaha kamopabhoga parama etavad iti nishchitaha So he says, as long as calm is there, a person has decided that desires, fulfilling worldly desires, is paramaha, is the supreme purpose of life. Then chintam aparimeyam cha. There will be fear, anxiety will be there. So desire and fear normally go together. And to expect that we can be fearless when we are full of desires, that is unrealistic. So now, when we talk about the protection of the Lord, this uh, often questions come up and in recent times questions are coming up more. Most of us are aware of what happened in Bangladesh and how things are becoming brutal. It's horrible. I just last year, the first time I went to Bangladesh and beautiful, such wonderful devotees are there and so many holy places. So, when we talk about the protection of the Lord, is it something which is hypothetical? Is it something which, uh, you know, yes, the Lord protects, but we have to be practical. So, does that mean that being practical is not having faith in the Lord's protection? So, I will start about this discussion from a broader philosophical perspective. See, there is, in the Vedic tradition, there is karma, there is karma, jnana and bhakti. 
Now, sometimes when we talk about bhakti, we talk about uh, going beyond karma and kyana to bhakti. But it is not that simple. Hmm? Basically, there is karma marga and jnana marga and bhakti marga. However, if you don't think of them as paths, we think of ways of looking at the world. The primary focus of karma is improving the world. Hmm? When that, you know, by, by our endeavors, by our efforts, we can improve the world. And when we talk about improving, the idea is dharma. See, so now modern, modern times we think of improvement means technological advancement and economical development, economic development. Well, that's one part of it. But the whole focus of dharma is that when we live in an orderly way, then things can be improved. When we follow our dharma, when other people follow our dharma, the, when society is organized in a dharmic way, then things can be better. Now this world will always have some uh, distress which is unavoidable. There is distress in the world which can be put in broadly two categories. There is unavoidable distress that nobody can, everybody is going to go old, get diseased and die. Now we all may talk about it in our introductory Gita course, the real problems of life. But whether we seek counselling from others or we give counselling to others, how many people come to us or how many times we go to others, oh, I am worried about old age, disease and death. You know, most of us, our problems are more, more with connected with this world. Oh, this person is behaving like this, I am not getting this, given this opportunity. That our problems are more adhyatmic, adhibhautik, adhidaivik. Mostly it's adhibhautik. That those are what hurt us the most. So, the thing is, there are problems which are unavoidable and there are problems which are avoidable. So, the avoidable problem, the unavoidable are birth, old age, disease and death. Hmm? The avoidable are the three with the top. Now, we can say we cannot avoid them completely, but to a large extent, they are, you could say, maybe unavoidable, you can use the word unchangeable, and you can say changeable. Changeable in the sense that if we learn to be polite and courteous and helpful, there will be some people who will always be rude. But it's quite likely that others will also be reciprocal and our relationships can be better. So there are avoidable problems or changeable problems which we can decrease in our life. And the karma marga focuses on these. The karma marga, the focus is that when we practice dharma, hmm, we can minimize the problems in our life. So dharma can mean yuktahara viharasya. So when we follow that, then our health can be better. Hmm. Now, the jnana marga focuses on these unavoidable problems. Hmm. And it says, oh, no matter how much karma you do, what difference is it going to make? Now, even if you maintain the best diet, still you're going to go old, get diseased and die eventually. So, these two have different emphasis. In the karma marga, the focus is on dharma. That we all should follow dharma. In jnana marga, the focus is on moksha. Now, in some ways, dharma and moksha are related, but they can also be almost opposite in their priority. In Jnana Marga, the idea is, okay, no matter how much dharma you follow, whether you are a pious person or an impious person, ultimately you have to die. And you have to go beyond death. So, maintaining the order in the world is not considered that important in Jnana Marga. Hmm. So, that's why, now Jnana Marga traditionally is for sannyasis. Hmm. Those who have renounced the world, those who don't really uh, care for the world because their view is even the good of this world is not really good enough. Hmm? It, is, it is insubstantial, it is insignificant. In fact, it's worse than insubstantial, insignificant. The good of the world is actually deceptive. 
the good of the world keeps us allured and entangled so that we don't ever realize, ever think about renouncing the world. Hmm? So that is the Jnana Marga. So now, in Bhakti, now if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, the Gita actually integrates both. Krishna himself does not in any way devalue Dharma. Krishna says, Dharma samsthapanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. So Krishna considers Dharma to be very important. So important that he, he wants to, comes to establish Dharma in this world. So Krishna is definitely not adopting wholesale the Jnana ethos. The Jnana ethos is this world is Dukkhalaya, just get out of it. Krishna says this world is Dukkhalaya. But then he tells Arjuna, you be a part of my plan to establish Dharma in this world. So, although this world is Dukkhale, Krishna tells Arjuna that Uttishta, you arise. The Smatam Uttishta Yashola Baswa Jitva Shatrun Bhungshiva Rajyam Samruddham Mayai Vaite Nihata Purva Meva Nimitta Matram Bhavasa Vesachi. You become an instrument for me and you will gain prosperity. You will gain prosperity. So Krishna is not talking only about the Dharma Mark. So, oh, sorry, only about the Moksha or the Jnana worldview. Now, of course, while Krishna talks about Dharma, it, he also talks about Moksha more in terms of attaining him. And there are many places he talks about this. More than a dozen places, Krishna says, if you do this, this, you will come to me. So both are emphasized in the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm? Dharma is not considered unimportant. At the same time, the Jnana worldview that, okay, it's not that by following Dharma, you can be happy in this world and therefore that's what you should try. Hmm. In one sense, the Mahabharata's worldview is the Dharma worldview. That you live virtuously and you get a kingdom in this world and then you will get heaven in the next world. So Arjuna says, Nahi prapashyami ma panudyat. No, this doesn't work for me. This has no meaning for me. So the Gita's worldview, actually, it integrates Dharma and the Dharma and Moksha. It integrates Karma and Jnana. Now, what has all this got to do with protection? I'll come to that shortly. But let's quickly try to understand this, this worldview. Say, if there is this, Abhavas is the ultimate reality. Hmm? The ultimate reality may be conceived as personal or impersonal, whatever. But in front of us is the world. Now, of course, we ourselves are a part of the world. But just for the conceptual purposes, right now, the world is in front of us. So, in karma, the focus is we act in this world with dharma. And then we can improve the world. Hmm? In jnana, in the Jnana Marga, our focus is, we simply want moksha. We want to have nothing to do with this world. And that's why the idea of sannyas is, get away from the things that will attract us and tempt us in this world. So, one is we turn toward the world to improve the world. The other is we turn away from the world to get out of the world. Now, taking to extremes, hmm, now, if we consider not just the karma worldview, but the karma marga. The karma marga, when we take it to extreme, it romanticizes the world. Romanticizes means, oh, this world is such a wonderful place. That if we just, if we just achieve this and we adjust this and we make this, then life will be wonderful. Hmm? So, the other is the jnana marga, which actually demonizes the world. This world is a terrible place. It is not just dangerous, but it is treacherous. The difference between dangerous and treacherous is, when it's dangerous, the danger is visible. Treacherous is, when the danger is invisible, something seems to be very comfortable. Like the Bhagavatam gives the example of somebody seems a grass covered well. We may think, oh this is nice grass, I can step on it, maybe I can lie down on it also. I lie down in it and I just go down and then I lie down permanently in it, <laughs> isn't it? So the world is not just dangerous but treacherous. Now Bhakti Marga is in between these two 
where the focus is we don't romanticize the world thinking that this world will give us happiness but we don't demonize the world also we utilize the world utilizes the world through the world we can serve the lord so for example here in bhakti marg it is through the world we attain krishna so in the bhakti marg our focus is on seva it is not so much on dharma it is not so much on moksha it is on seva through service to the lord we can attain the lord and that service can be by turning toward the world and acting in the world and that service can also be done by turning away from the world so now vidura has through most of his life turned toward the world been in a kingdom and acted in the world and now he saying in the last the phase of my life when i was i turned away from the world so he is in the forest and he has served the lord that way also so bhakti in that sense includes and transcends both of these it bhakti can be done with the karma world view that if we try to serve the lord in this world then we can improve the things in this world now nobody can remove old age disease and that that is true but even before that things can be improved so there is not a complete apathy toward the things of this world after yudhishthir becomes the king when bhishma persuades him one of the things that he does is there are so many widows there are so many orphans he arranges to take care of them the whole kingdom is in a state of chaos after the war has happened and he has to take responsibility and that responsibility cannot be taken if one thinks of oh, this world is dukhale so in bhakti both these world views are included now broadly speaking we can say the gita focuses on bhakti in this way where the bhagavatam focuses on gita focuses on bhakti through the karma mark the bhagavatam focuses more on bhakti through the gyana mark not through the gyana marga sorry through the gyana world view marga means it's a whole the, we adopt the sadhana practices also see in krishna wants arjuna to act in this world and change things in this world so arjuna wants to renounce but krishna says no don't renounce mm -hmm. now on the other hand the bhagavatam is focused on parikshit maharaj who has already renounced the world and unlike krishna who wanted arjuna to turn back and fight shukdev goswami doesn't want parikshit to go back parikshit has already accepted that i have a renunciation and shukdev goswami's purpose is to reinforce his conviction so we could say bhakti when we utilize the world there are two aspects to it there is the world transforming aspect of bhakti where we act in the world this is where we take the karma path more and there is the world transcending aspect of bhakti where we turn away from the world that is more of the gyana world view being taken hmm. so both these approaches can very much be taken when we are trying to serve the lord now in the gaudiya tradition broadly speaking we have the bhajananandis and the goshtanandis so they are they can be broadly associated with the world transcending and the world transforming so individuals like gaur gushal baba ji or jagannath das baba ji you know they they were world transcendent they were not interested really in traveling and preaching and trying to deliver others their focus was world transcending and they were exalted devotees bhakti vinod thakur bhakti sans thakur shila prabhupad uh, they were also transcendental in their consciousness but their approach was more world transforming that's why in our tradition we have the idea that for the purpose of preaching a uttam adhikari comes down to the level of a madhyam adhikari hmm? and then we can actually share bhakti effectively now why does all this matter i was in mayapur some time ago and after the yatra only actually one devotee asked me when we had a lot of discussions with different people so he said that you know that you say that we should have faith in krishna but then you have security in your temples 
you know you say that you tell us grahasthas to have faith in krishna but it seems you yourself don't have faith in krishna that's why you have security in your temples you know that's why you arrange for so many things for your protection so is this being hypocritical is this being inconsistent well not exactly it could be if it is not done in the proper consciousness but the point is if we are practicing bhakti with the karma world view where we are focusing on trying to improve things in this world so that they can become better offerings for the lord then we cannot expect we cannot act as if we will function in the jnana world view and just depend on the lord's protection see in terms of our endeavors if we if we could have two ways of looking at it ultimately everything in this world is insignificant everything in the world dukkhale then why even try to build a temple because the temple is in the material world isn't it now why try to have seminars or vaishnava relationships ultimately this world is dukkhale and relationships are going to cause problems so why try to do anything to improve at all and if we are going to do anything to improve things in the world then why stop the efforts at improvement with regards to protection you know we do everything to improve things we build a temple and we say okay for protection will depend on the lord if i going to if that is the idea of the lord's protection then why depend on the lord only for protecting the temple depend on the lord for building the temple also is it it we can't do that so if you see how do we know that the gita is more focused on this karma marga not the karma marga sorry again the karma way of serving the world is that at the end of the gita yatra yogeshwara krishna yatra partha dhanurdhara so the question comes up over here that tatra shrir vijayo bhutir dhruva nitir matir mama that where there is krishna and where there is arjuna there there is prosperity there there is glory there there is victory now if we consider prosperity to be lakshmi devi then wherever there is krishna who is lakshmi nath who is narayan there there will be lakshmi so why is the need to mention arjuna over there wherever there is krishna there will be lakshmi where there is vishnu there will be lakshmi where there is krishna there will be bhuti so why does arjuna need to be mentioned over there because we are talking about the material world and in this world if prosperity is to be manifested it is very rare that god works entirely on his own in this world god works through human instruments and that's why yatra partha dhanurdhara so arjuna's readiness to fight and to be an instrument of krishna's will is emphasized See, the purpose of the gita is not just proclaiming god's position yes that is an important part of the gita but that is not the primary focus of the gita that could have been done anywhere why is that done on the battlefield in the middle to arjuna specifically the gita's purpose much more is transforming man's disposition it is arjuna was undecided about fighting so god does not rhyme with human so i'll not be gender neutral here so god's god proposes humanity disposes it doesn't work like that man proposes so i'm using not man includes woman over here but <laughs> the thing is that the gita's purpose is transforming our disposition it is to infuse us with the conviction that if we serve the lord there will be glory that will result and that's why the human actions are important when we are serving lord in the lord in this world and that's why when we when we talk about desecration of temples in the medieval times in india or when we talk about extremist violence currently in certain countries you know when we start asking where is god well, why ask 
about the role of God only when that protection is lacking. You know, yes, we humans, if we have to arrange for our food every day, if we have to arrange for decorating the Lord, the dressing the Lord and serving the Lord, then when suddenly it comes to protection, we start thinking, God has not protect. And why did God not protect? No, making arrangements for protection is also a human responsibility. So, another way to put this is, when we talk about devotion, bhakti, it has two distinct aspects. There is faith, but there is also service attitude. So generally, faith can be more passive. Oh, I have faith in God. Hmm? But service attitude is more active. So if there is a focus only on faith, too much extreme, it can go towards the Jnana Marga. So it can be that, okay, in this world, there was a temples were desecrated, in this world people were killed. But, uh, I have faith in God, I have faith in the ultimate reality of spirituality. And everything in this world is temporary, anyway it is destroyed. Uh, maybe the way it was destroyed was terrible. But that's how it is. So if somebody is that detached from the world, then that faith remains unshaken. Because for them, it's very clearly understood that this world, the good and the bad, both are ultimately a part of the duality. Even the spiritual work we do in the material world is not going to have permanent results in the material world. Even when the Lord descends, the order that the Lord establishes stays for some time. It goes away. And that's why Sambhavami Yuge Yuge. So, if we are going to focus only on faith, that okay, whatever is God's plan, that will happen. Then if there is a singular focus on faith, that's not wrong, but then that needs to be associated with a worldview that is primarily centered on Jnana. That, okay, this world is inconsequential, whatever happens here doesn't matter. Then we shouldn't be worried about the atrocities that may happen in the world. But if we, if the no, I'm not necessarily using the word, we are more attached to the world. If the way we want to serve the world is not so much world transcending, it is more world transforming, then we cannot focus on faith alone. Along with faith, now if there's only seva, but if there's not sufficient bhakti, then that can become mundane. That can become more, that can go toward the extreme of karma. But what does service attitude mean? Service attitude essentially means we want to do things for God. And it means that not that God does things for us. So we see even in the Gaudiya tradition, even with respect to the topmost sannyasis, topmost sannyasis of the Goswamis, we have the pastimes where, say, the Goswamis refuse to build a Vajan Kutir and a tiger comes over there. And the Lord comes to protect. Now that the Lord comes to protect is glorious. It is a testimony to their devotion. But the mood of the Goswamis is, oh, I don't want the Lord to come to protect me. I am here to serve the Lord. And therefore, they decide to build a, build a Vajan Kutir. So service attitude means, so if we overemphasize protection the Lord's protection, I have faith in the Lord's protection. Then, if we de-emphasize service attitude, then what is happening is, in the name of faith, instead of we doing things for God, we are expecting God to do things for us. And that is the antithesis of service attitude. Now, when we say we do things, there are two distinct over here. There is what we can do, and there is much that what we can't do. Because that is not in our control. So now our service attitude has to be to do what we can do. And then our faith will be that what we can't do will be taken care of by Krishna. But if we focus only on faith, then what happens is, we, if we are not doing what we can do, then that is not a proper understanding of dependence on the Lord. That is not a proper understanding of faith. 
because in one sense if we see krishna ultimately sorry okay if we see krishna it is if we truly understand krishna okay krishna can protect me by doing what i can't do but truly if i understand krishna is the doer of everything what i can do that is also being done by krishna through me and if in the name of passivity i don't do what i can do then that is not my faith in krishna that is rather i impeding krishna from doing what he wants to do through me so god's will i mean have faith in god's will but it's important to understand that god's will can happen in two distinct ways god's will can happen to us that means whatever happens to me i accept it but god's will is also meant to happen through us through us means we are also meant to be instrument for doing god's will so we see in some situations where there is very little in our control then faith in krishna's protection means that we raise our arms like draupadi did so whatever happens krishna i accept it so this is the mood of whatever happens i accept now this is in the bible oh father let thy will be done not mine that is one mode of protection parikshit maharaj is whatever is your will i want to accept it now arjuna is not saying let thy will be done it is i will do thy will karishye vachanam tava so it is arjuna's way of surrendering to krishna is not raising his arms it is raising his arms <laughs> it is raising his his weapon his gandiva in readiness to fight so when we understand this point that if we are serving the lord in this world if our primary focus of service is doing something in this world then all the endeavor that we do to serve should also include taking what measures we can take for the protection now of course dangers can come beyond our capacity to defend or even a conception of what danger can come that is true but it is we need to do what we can so now so this was the main first point the remaining two points are later shorter when we talk about god's protection and fearlessness fearlessness in bhakti so the last part of the session will be i'll talk about these two extremes and we will talk about what is in between as the balance so one extreme in the name of fearlessness we can go toward recklessness recklessness means i don't consider any danger at all that whatever happens oh krishna will protect now yes krishna can protect and krishna will protect by giving you the intelligence to not do that thing also krishna can protect us with the intelligence coming as warnings from others you know maybe you should not be doing this thing so when in the early days devotees started preaching so they had such zeal to preach they would go anywhere and everywhere to preach and sometimes the devotees started going uh, to night clubs and they would perform kirtan over there now for western people those who are there hippies in the counter culture for them this was just music and okay any this band come that band come the hari krishna band comes they just want some music going on but when the devotees told where they were going prabhupad said that we should think you know what are we trying to do over here are we likely to make devotees over here or are we likely to unmake devotees over here <laughs> is it he did use the word unmake but are we like making devotees or are we losing devotees over here so we have to consider danger just being faithful does not mean being reckless now prabhupad glorified one of his disciples who went to pakistan to preach and he was preaching openly and but then prabhupad was in was in great concern in anxiety when the news came that somebody has been killed over there and then prabhupad uh, when he came back safe prabhupad was so grateful for the courage that he had shown but prabhupad did say okay he has done such a wonderful thing all of you go there and do the same thing no 
Prabhupada was prudent. Prabhupada was, is there a purpose to be served? Is there, we, we are not meant to be reckless in the name, in the name of being fearless. We have to, often this example is used of Prabhupada saying that, oh, we should uh, shoot a rhino. Hmm? Now, uh, Prabhupada used that in a particular context. Now, of course, shooting rhinos, nowadays, see, in the past, even 50, 60, 100 years ago, hunting animals was considered to be a sport. Now, hunting is widely disapproved and rhino is an injured species. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is why, you know, when, uh, when one of Prabhupada's disciples wrote a book, it was about hunting rhinos, he changed to chasing rhinos. Now, that metaphor doesn't really work very well, because hunting rhinos is very difficult, they are such giant creatures. But chasing rhinos is not that difficult but because rhinos don't run so fast. So, <laughs> the point is that he wanted to keep the metaphor but at the same time not provoke people, trigger people today. But the point is, what did he use that metaphor of chasing rhinos for? It was for the big pandal program that they did in Cross Maidan, where thousands, hundreds of thousands of people came. So, Prabhupada said, what is the use of your being Americans if you don't do something wonderful for Krishna? Hmm? But the theme over there was that this was a one-time program. And if it works, wonderful. If it doesn't work, okay. You tried, it didn't work. Now Prabhupada did not take that same devil-may-care approach to say, building a temple. He says, we'll build a giant temple and you know, Krishna will provide for the maintenance of the temple. No, Prabhupada never had that approach. For example, in Vindavan, and Mayapur, where he built temples, one of the first things he built was MVT. Because he knew in those places, we may not get donations locally. Now, of course, this college has become a big uh, name and people give donations. We have devotees from all over the world coming. But Prabhupada said, let tourists, spiritually minded pilgrims come over here and we will give them good places for staying. And through that, we will have some arrangement for revenues. So, it is not that faith in Krishna's protection, in the name of that, Prabhupada was reckless. Hmm. So, Prabhupada, when he was in 26-7 Avenue, uh, not before that, when he was in the place where David Allen was staying with him, and that David went mad because of drugs, and he charged towards Prabhupada. Prabhupada did not just stand there, thinking Krishna will protect me in some way. Prabhupada left that place. And then Prabhupada used his intelligence. What can I do? He contacted some of the people, he went to a nearby payphone, pay, payphone booth, and he called some of the people who were there, who should attend his program and they arranged an alternate, alternate place for him to stay. So Prabhupada was not reckless. This is what we say, Prabhupada's head was in the sky but his feet were on the ground. He was in that sense grounded. Now, the other extreme could be, we are become spineless. Spineless means what? That we don't have courage. Even the smallest opposition, forget it, let's not do it. No, we are speaking philosophy at one point, agitate someone. Oh, let me not speak this point. You know, if we are going to share bhakti, if we are going to actually be teaching and transforming people, then we have to be ready to face opposition. Now, if we just want to make everyone happy, you know, start an ice cream distribution charity. <laughs> you, know, you cannot be a spiritual teacher if you want to make everyone happy. We want everyone to be ultimately happy. But the path to eventual happiness often goes through initial unhappiness. The unhappiness that our preconceptions are shaken. So, if we are afraid of danger, if we are afraid of trouble, and that's why we don't serve the Lord at all, then we won't even be able to give a proper class what to speak of, go out and do some preaching and do some service. Uh, we cannot be spineless. Now, in between these two extremes, let fear dominate us, spineless is, fear dominates us. And when we talk about reckless, it's like we reject fear completely. Now fear can very well be a valid warning of danger. Nothing in God's creation is completely a waste. So fear is a part of the psychological mechanism that God has provided us by which we are alerted to the presence of danger. 
Now, if uh, from a 10 story building, a uh, small child is peering out of the window and looking down. Child says, I don't feel any fear. The mother will say, I feel very much fear now. Come back, isn't it? So fear itself is not a bad thing. So fear is important and even we need to have fear when we are considering what we are trying to do. But fear should not be the decision maker for us. So you want to avoid both these extremes. Then what do we do? How do we find the balance? So I'll conclude this with one acronym and we'll talk about how this is manifested in Arjuna's life itself. How Arjuna acts. So N-E-W. We'll see if I get one more time and at one point add that at the end. So is it necessary? Is it necessary to do this service? See, Arjuna had Krishna's protection. Arjuna had faith in Krishna. But even then Arjuna didn't rush into the war. Not only before the war where Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, but even be much before it, there's a lot of deliberation. Can we try to avoid the confrontation? Can we avoid the danger? Can we avoid the destruction? So, is this particular, if, the, if we know there is some danger, there is some challenge, is it necessary? Now, many times it is necessary. But we can't unnecessarily create trouble and expect God to protect us. It's not that I drive above the speed limit and say Krishna should protect me. No, if we, you know, sometimes if we drive above the speed limit, Krishna leaves the car. <laughs> is it, you know, so is it necessary? So we have to consider what we are doing. Is it, is it something which is required? So fearlessness, it is not the absence of fear. The complete absence of fear, as I said, could be unhealthy because we have not recognized there is a danger. It is the presence of a purpose bigger than fear. This is so important for me that even if there is some fear, even if there is some danger, I am going to do this. The presence of a purpose bigger than fear. So when we are doing some service, is it necessary? Now necessary can, necessity can be evaluated in different ways, I am not going to go into over here. But is it necessary? Then the second part is, are we equipped? Shla Prabhupada, when he went to, if you see, let's look at Arjuna, we look at Prabhupada if we get time. Now Arjuna, he had faith in Krishna's protection. But still, he practiced archery throughout his life. And before the war, while in the forest, he didn't just wait passively. He actually performed tapasya to get various weapons. So what is in our power to do? We need to be doing that. If we want to become a singer, if we want to become a preacher, then we have to acquire the necessary skills. Oh, I'll just go and just give a class. I have faith in Krishna's protection. Well, we may have faith in Krishna's protection, but by that more, others will lose faith in Krishna's protection. <laughs> Isn't it? Others will say, I don't want to come for such classes. <laughs> Isn't it? So, are we equipped? Are we prepared? When I started giving classes, I was given a 10-point guideline about how to give classes. And the last point was depend on Krishna. But, in bracket, depend on Krishna, but only after you have prepared. <laughs> so, are we equipped? So, Arjuna equipped himself with weapons. Hmm. Prabhupada equipped himself with the Bhagavatam. You know? Prabhupada considered his Bhagavatam to be his ammunition. Once he had that, he said, I'll go abroad. Now, Prabhupada always, he knew that his Guru Maharaj had told him to go to the West and preach. And that was always in his mind. But Prabhupada, initially when he was trying to do outreach in India, he was in one sense trying to follow his spiritual master. His spiritual master had established a substantial base in India. Bhakti Sahaja Thakur had lots of temples. And then with that base in India, he, he sent his disciples abroad. In fact, entire the travel and the staying and everything of his disciples was sponsored by the Gaudiya Mat from India. So in one sense, when Prabhupada went at the end of his life, it was not that he was neglecting or downplaying his spiritual master's mission to preach in the West or preach in the English language. Even in India, Prabhupada chose to focus on the English language only. Although he could have gone much more followers if he had preached in Bengali or in Hindi. So he was following his spiritual master's instructions. 
But eventually he decided that a base in India is not working out. So then he decided to go to America directly. So that was necessary at that time. He said that this is near the end of my life. I have to do this. But even then he was equipped for it. Now after he was equipped, then we have are we wholehearted? Wholehearted. Now what does wholehearted means? Are we putting in our best efforts? So we see there are not many places during the Kurukshetra war that Krishna intervened in some miraculous ways. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is the incident where and Arjuna was supposed to kill Jayadrat and Krishna covered the sun. That is there. But when did that happen? It was after Arjuna fought to the fullest of his capacity. It was Arjuna had done everything that was humanly possible. He had gone so close to Jayadrat and he would have succeeded. But at that time Duryodhan suddenly got eight warriors. He had got six for Abhimanyu. He got eight for Arjuna. And he blocked him. Arjuna was so close and yet so far. So when we do what we can, then God will do what we can't. So after Arjuna had done his wholehearted endeavor, then Krishna did. And Krishna did spectacular things. So uh, Krishna arranged for Arjuna to be protected. We see how much Prabhupada himself endeavored. He gave his whole heart and with practically no results. Even when he went to America, it was very difficult. And especially when David turned to attack him. It was not just a physical danger, it was also the, the emotional, not just disappointment, but betrayal. That person David, Prabhupada returned to Sukti Muraji saying that he is likely to become the first American Vaishnava. And imagine the person who we think will become a devotee comes and attacks us. You know, even a person who is about to become a devotee, we invested some time in them, and suddenly they stop uh, coming to temple, they stop responding to phone calls in modern teenage life, they ghost us. You know, we feel bad after that also, but imagine somebody comes and attacks us. How much demoralizing would have been? Prabhupada could have given up. Prabhupada did everything that he could. He was wholehearted in his endeavor. And then the last point is, let's conclude this, news that we have to ultimately have submission. Submission means that I may have faith in Krishna's protection, but then I should not be demanding the means how Krishna will protect me. So Krishna, Arjuna accepted that Abhimanyu passed away. Arjuna accepted that eventually his other son was also killed by with Ashwatthama. He did not lose his faith. He did not reject Krishna or resent Krishna because of that. Srila Prabhupada was given by Krishna extraordinary unparalleled success. And yet Prabhupada had to accept Krishna's will in terms of submission. The single project on which Prabhupada invested more effort than anything else was the Juhu temple. And the Juhu temple was inaugurated in Jan 78. And Prabhupada departed in November. Now Prabhupada had put his life and heart and blood in building this Juhu temple. And Prabhupada could have said to Krishna, Krishna, please let me see the inauguration of this temple. But when Prabhupada was asked in his last days, do you have a last desire? Prabhupada said, Kuchi chale. Now it is one thing to be detached from things that are there for our material pleasure. But to be able to let go of the thing that we have invested our entire life in or a large part of our life in for, for the Lord's sake. And then to not be able to see that. So the Lord's protection came in a different way. That the teacher lives and the followers live on with him. It was not that Prabhupada did not get to see the Juhu temple. Prabhupada was there as the deity. Prabhupada's mission was carried on by his disciples and his followers. But the point is that if we have faith in Krishna's protection, then we need to also have faith in the way Krishna protects. And sometimes Krishna may not protect us in the way he wants us to. So if we don't, we are not at that level. You know, I want this to be transformed in this particular way. 
and this is my offering to Krishna, then we can't just, okay, I'll depend on Krishna only. I have to invest my efforts. And that ultimate submission that is there, sometimes Krishna may not work things out the way we want them to. So, we submission means that we accept the responsibility, but we don't necessarily expect the results. The results may or may not come in the way we want. When we have it in this, this understanding, then actually, then our faith in Krishna is holistic. And when we put that faith in Krishna's protection, whatever happens in life will actually nourish our faith. And it won't shake our faith. Rather, through whatever happens, it's like Vidura is saying, that I am not astonished. That I have become more and more convinced and energized in my service to the Lord. That will happen to us through whatever we get amid life's ups and downs. So I'll summarize what I discussed today. Our topic was the Lord's pro Krishna's protection, specifically faith in Krishna's protection. What does it mean? So the first point was the most elaborate point. I talked about level. We talked about how there are broadly two distinct ways of looking at the world. There is the karma marga which focuses on improving the world, romanticizes the world. There is the jnana marga, which focuses on rejecting the world. Hmm? But the bhakti marga focuses on utilizing the world in Krishna's service. So, sannyasis, those who have renounced the world, especially the mood of sannyas that Vidura has taken, which Prabhupada is referring to, that combination of abhaya and sattva samshuddhi is, we can have fear to the extent we are free from desire. Now, bhakti can be performed in both ways. Bhakti can be performed through the karma path. Karma is about simply changing the world. Jnana is about renouncing the world. Now, bhakti can be performed through the world. Bhakti can be performed through the world transcending and world transforming both ways. But if we are focusing on the world transforming way of practicing bhakti, then we need to do all that will be required for such things, that is, including seeking protection, doing what we can for our protection, for the protection of our service to the Lord. So, bhakti is inclusive and then we discussed that once we understand the level at which I am practicing, then the key is that we have, there is, okay, then I talked about the extremes and avoiding the extremes, L-E-T was the overall economic extremes, that when we are talking about Bhakti, Bhakti has both aspects to it. There is the faith aspect, but there is the service attitude aspect also. That God will do things, God will take care of things. What service attitude means? I have to take care of things as a service to God. So it's only faith is when, say, there is what is in my control, that is what is beyond control. So for what is in control, I need to have service attitude. I need to have seva bhav. And for what is beyond my control, then I need faith over there, that the Lord will take care of that. So, we discussed that Arjuna's example is more in terms of service attitude. Karishye vachanam tava, I'll do your will. Here we discuss Draupadi and Parikshit Maharaj. Their example is more in terms of whatever the Lord's will, I accept it. So, there are different modes in which bhakti can be practiced. So, based on this, we want to avoid the extremes of recklessness in the name of faith where we don't consider danger and we want to avoid spinelessness where we in the name of fear we don't do anything so now when we want to be truly faithful how can we do that we discuss the example of through that that balance that transcendental consciousness we can have while serving in this world for transforming the world we discussed about news N was, is it necessary? We, if you want to take some danger, is it necessary for our service? Prabhupada tried to build a base in India. When he couldn't, then he went abroad all alone. Arjuna tried to settle peacefully. It didn't work. Then he, he was, war was fought. Then equipped. Prabhupada got the Bhagavatams as his equipment. Arjuna got Divyastras through austerity for fighting. Then wholehearted. And Arjuna fought to the best of his capacity. And when he couldn't reach Jayadrath, finally Krishna intervened. 
Prabhupada did everything he could and then finally Krishna gave him success in the last years of his life and finally submission if we have faith in the Lord's protection ultimately it is that we need to accept the responsibility but at the same time we can't be insisting or expecting that results come in a particular way Arjuna had to accept the death of his sons uh, Prabhupada had to accept that uh, he couldn't get to see the Juhu temple so when we have this understanding of the Lord's protection then this holistic understanding of bhakti then whatever we may go through life in our lives eh, during our service to the Lord that will bring us closer to the Lord whether we succeed in transforming the world or not we will be go going closer to the Lord whether it is through changing the world or without changing the world thank you very much Hare Krishna Do we have time for questions? Maybe one question anyone has? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, is, is karma or bhakti is possible without jnana? Is karma bhakti possible without jnana? It depends on what we mean by jnana. If jnana basically means knowledge, we all require knowledge. Now, if jnana refers to the world view, hmm, then does one need the jnana world view? Not necessarily. One has to have philosophical knowledge. But the jnana world view centers on how this world is filled with maya and we have to get out of this world. Does one need that world view? Not necessarily. See, the world can be seen as being filled with vishaya. Vishaya is sense objects. And vishaya is, vishaya is sense objects which can be seen as uh, Vishya, they are poison. Sir, so the Gyan, yeah? Can you speak, speak in Hindi? It will be. Okay, can we talk one to one separate? Afterwards, after the class, we will talk. Okay? Remember, so, tell, tell in English. We will. So, the world can be seen as filled with Vishaya, that is the sense objects, and this is the Jnana worldview. But the world, the Gita itself says, the world can be seen as filled with Vibhutis. Vibhutis are the Lord's opulences in this world. And if you are seeing the Lord's Vibhutis, then we can, we can remember the Lord through them and we can reach the Lord through using whatever Vibhutis are possible. So the Jnana worldview is not required for the service of the Lord, but it can also be used in the service of the Lord. The Jnana Marga, so Jnana Marga jo hai, that cannot be used in Bhakti. The Jnana Marga focuses on the ultimate reality being impersonal. So with that we cannot serve the Lord. So thank you very much. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki cha. Srila Prabhupada ki cha. Gaur Bhakta Vrindaki cha. Gaur Premanandi.